Hi everyone, I'm super excited you're with us today because I've been anticipating this conversation for a very long time. Beiju bought with me today and he is the co-founder of Robinhood, a zero commission stock trading app. Thanks so much for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Can we start out with you just describing how Robinhood works? Yeah, um, I can describe how the product works. It's basically a tool that lets you buy and sell stocks. Um, so every stock that's um, listed on a U.S. stock exchange, you can buy and sell with your iPhone app. And the thing that's really unique about Robinhood is that historically, if you've wanted to do this with another online broker like E-Trade or Fidelity, they charge you seven to ten dollars per trade. But Robinhood um, doesn't charge anything per trade, so it's it's a free stock brokerage. I love it, and that's something that really drew me guys to drew me to you guys in the early days. And you actually said it best. I think you said. You came up with the idea just by sitting with your co-founder, Vlad, and saying, could we do something bigger than this? Couldn't we try to do something better than this? Now that Robinhood has launched and you're getting such a warm reception from people, how are you making this mentality the culture at your company? I think that's, that's a really big challenge. Um, I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge that we have is sort of being a company that kind of sticks true to a name like Robin Hood. Um, I think that was something that was a fairly controversial decision, at least when we when we first made it to call ourselves Robin Hood. Um, but we wanted to do it because um, we kind of wanted to put like we kind of wanted to drive a stake into the ground and say that we were going to be a financial company that was going to operate and think about how we operated differently, even outside of just this one product that we're making, which is um, a zero commission stock brokerage. So I think it's it's a lot of different things, right? It's like a lot of the people that we hire and what sort of values we look for when we're hiring them, um, all the way through to kind of like our product roadmap of other things that we're going to make. And um, for us, I think it's important to kind of connect the dots so that when you think about, when you hear about a company that's a financial services company called Robinhood, um, if you've heard of it before, you're like, oh, yeah, it's the zero commission stock brokerage. But eventually we want people to be like, oh, yeah, they're the ones that offer those really, really easy to use and extremely cost effective financial products. And one of those things has been a quarter percent of your users being first investors, which yeah. I know is making you guys feel like you have a big responsibility. You've been in this industry for a long time. What advice do you have to someone who downloaded Robinhood and just wants to start understanding the stock market? Um, <clears throat> that's, that's an interesting question. Um, you know, I think the thing that really sticks out to me about this whole product and kind of product space <clears throat> um, is that the, the stock market as a whole, I think, is a really positive part of the U.S. economy and, like, broadly speaking, the American experience. And I think the thing that really struck me when we started out doing this was so many of the people that we knew that were kind of of our age, um, you know, really didn't trust the system at all. And so I think the thing that I would, I would kind of, I would say is that, you know, this is a really unique privilege that we as Americans have to get a chance to participate in the stock market. And, you know, that's really not something that we should be taking lightly. I think we have um, a lot of benefits participating in the system, but to a certain degree, we kind of have a responsibility to be a part of the system um, and make sure that we, you know, support the companies that that we believe in and that we maybe don't support the ones that we don't believe in, right? So I know with this type of vision, you've had a lot of different investors very excited to team up with you guys. To name a few, you have Google Ventures, Index Index Ventures, Andreessen and Horowitz. What were those initial conversations like when you came in and said, hey, we're going to disrupt one of the biggest industries in the country? <clears throat> um, it, it was, I think there was a lot of optimism, optimism around the idea and the, the concept of a financial company that tried to operate it very differently. Um, I think there was initially a lot, of, um, there was a lot of hesitation around the idea of whether or not younger people would actually want to invest. Um, I think that was a, a big reservation that a lot of people had. 
um, when we were originally raising money. And uh, honestly, that was something that was just kind of a, a hypothesis that we had, is that if we built this product, it would probably appeal to uh, younger consumers. And it's been pretty awesome to see that that's actually what's happening, right? Like, it's like the sort of the demographic of consumers that adopt this product is is not something that we can really directly control. Like, it's kind of whoever finds it most interesting signs up for it as, has been how it's been so far. Um, and it's been really awesome to see that. It, it really does strike a chord with young people. Well, it's striking a huge chord, and I know you're being humble, but over 500,000 people were signed up to your wait list before you launched. And yeah. <laughs> moving into the media and how you've gotten press, I learned a great word from Luke, who's one of the co-founders at Casper, that a product can sometimes be mediagenic. So people gravitate towards it. And it's like I told you, I learned about Robinhood. Immediately text my little brother because I couldn't believe what you guys are doing. What is your reaction to press like that? How do you make the most out of it? Um, I, think it I think it stems from the fact that the message of the product is, is somewhat controversial, right? I think it has a lot to do with acknowledging that distrust in, in Wall Street and the financial system has basically never been higher than it is right now. Um, so I think that's kind of like where it, it comes from is that we're just kind of like acknowledging that that's the way a lot of people feel. Um, you know, beyond that, I think it's really important that like for a consumer company like ours that we have like an identifiable brand. And so like it's it's cool that that's happening. Um, yeah, I, I don't know that there's any particular way that we sort of alter our our approach to it because um, a lot of you know media is it does it is an easily understandable message to the media. Um, yeah. Are you guys going after media to get press, or are they mostly coming to you? A lot of it has been inbound so far. Um, a lot of it has been inbound, but we obviously like there's. You know, we're not on everyone's radar, and there's definitely outlets that, like, we read and that we're really excited about, and so we reach out to them a lot. Um, and we've been fortunate to have a lot of those people cover us, too, so. What yeah. was it like when the first big publication covered you? Uh, what was that feeling? It was pretty amazing. Um, I think the way it happened is uh, is a mystery to a lot of people. So when we were working on, on Robin Hood, um, when we were working on first announcing it, <clears throat> this was in, I think, December of 2013. Mm -hmm. um, we were we were going to do like a press announcement that we'd raised a round of seed funding, and that we were working on this zero commission stock brokerage idea. Um, and so we put together like a new website for it, and we had it all up at Robinhood.io, which is the domain that we had at the time. And uh, we were scheduled to actually announce it the following Thursday. But I think um, what happened was somebody found that we had posted this uh, website, and they like they put it on on Reddit. And oh no! <laughs> yeah, this was on like a Friday. This was on like a Friday night. Um, they posted it on Reddit, and it like immediately got to the top of um, like r slash finance and r slash stocks and a lot of those subreddits. And we're like, oh, okay. Um, you know, this is kind of interesting. And so we wake up the next morning. This is like a Saturday morning. Um, and I'm, I'm like flipping through uh, Hacker News and it's just like the top hit on Hacker News. And I just like, I didn't even notice it there because I'd, I'd written the tagline. And so I just like, it just didn't even compute when I, when I read it. And I just scrolled back. I was like, wait a sec. What? Who are those Robin Hood guys? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so that was like a pretty awe-inspiring moment. I think that was the the moment, like the first weekend that we were that we were alive, that we kind of like got launched by mistake. We had like I think between I think it was like seventy five thousand people sign up. Oh my god! Yeah, and so that was like kind of the moment that we're like, okay, like we we might be onto something. Um, at least for me, that was the moment where I was like, okay, we've you know this is something that a lot of people actually care about. So in that moment, you know, you guys were planning on launching a week later. And then you wake up Saturday, you see that on Growth Hacker News. A part of me, if I was in your position, would initially be like, oh my God, what am I going to do? The plan went downhill. 
How does you react to that quickly and say, hey, we're ready for this. Let's move forward and let's move forward fast. Um, I, I think it was just kind of like, um, it's kind of like this delicate balance of like when, when as an entrepreneur, you kind of like exert, one exerts oneself to like be like, okay, this is how we want this to be or this is how we kind of like want this to play out. And there are other times where it's just kind of best to just <laughs> let, let, you know, like the, the world run its course. And so we were definitely in that camp um, where if it was just going to get out and it was growing by itself, then sure, we were fine with that. It was honestly like, it was honestly kind of a relief because, you know, I don't, I don't think that we really knew how to do PR or like time um, releases or announcements or anything like that all that well. I mean, we talked to some people that had given us advice on it, but it was kind of interesting to see what happens when it just kind of happens by itself. That's great. That's a big bonus. <laughs> so I want to shift yeah. gears for a couple seconds and actually talk about the mobile app. One of the things you guys have done that is radically different is go mobile first. Why did you choose to do that? We decided to do that because, frankly, we at least I find most of the other online brokerages really complicated. They're a disaster. I don't even know how to use mine. Yeah, I just like, I remember when I signed up for E-Trade um, a while back, I remember as I was signing up for it, um, there was like a point at which I got an email, um, this was after I'd like submitted my application, I got an email that said um, I needed to open a PDF, and the PDF had a phone number on it, it's like call this number to like find out the status of your account, so I call that number, and I get a message that's like your account is being reviewed and I was just like like <laughs> like really <laughs> like could this could this have been made any more complicated um and so I think that's like um that's like kind of an example of how a lot of online brokerages are just really complicated um and so we just wanted to we thought that that was a, a difficult problem of like taking what the most important parts of keeping track of your portfolio and buying and selling new stocks are and just like really distilling it down to those like core few things. And once um, you guys did that and you went to mobile, you really focused on design, which yeah. I would never really have thought of because it's almost a utility app. I'm going in to review stuff to make trades. Why is design important to you, especially for our demographic? Um. I think design is important. I, I would say that it's important because Apple and a lot of these, like, I would say specifically Apple has just set the bar really high for any consumer company at this point. That, like, if you want to be a large scale consumer company, you've got to do a really good job with design. Um, I think more specifically, though, we as a company early on, we're just got. We were really excited about doing a good job with design. Um, we'd gotten some really good mentorship in our early days from the design team at Google Ventures, and that was just like that was just one of those um, it's like one of those experiences where you learn about something new, and you're just like, I think this is really interesting. Like, I have a very deep academic curiosity about how to do a really good job with design. Um, because it's really, it's kind of like magic sometimes, you know? Like you use a product and it's just like, it makes you feel a strong sense of the people that made it the first time you use it. And it's hard to kind of know when a product is going to do that. But when it does, it just, it's like a very, very big part of the experience. Um, yeah. You can tell in 90 seconds. I was just reading something today that you have 90 seconds when a consumer opens up your app. And if you can get them in that 90 seconds, they'll stay. But if they drop off, you're likely to get deleted. Yeah, I think that makes sense. We we optimized the experience to to be useful in like 30 second use cases. That was kind of like our, our holy grail. So I, I think actually in the past people have asked us like, like what was what was like what were the overarching like design decisions and like what were the thoughts that motivated how we actually designed the product and um, we actually kind of distilled it down to first principles and our our first principle was that we wanted to make it um, 
a useful experience in 30 seconds or less. And so from, from that like one benchmark is like where the entire project grew out of. Um, so things like using Touch ID to authenticate. Um, we realize that probably like 90% of the sessions that people have with the product, they just want to see their portfolio value right now. That's it. So we wanted to make that just really easy. That was just the first thing you saw. And then for like the extra 10% of times that you actually wanted to trade, we wanted to make buying or selling a stock like three or four taps away. How do so, you think of those things being the most important? Um, uh, what do you mean? How did, so you just discussed those three things as being primary to what you wanted to distinguish the app for your user. How did mm -hmm. you know that you wanted to do that? That those were the things you were going to focus on? Um, I, I think it was sort of around this intuition that like that was the defining characteristic of good mobile products. Um, it's kind of interesting like since then a lot of like I think it's it's been studied a lot more and it is kind of clear that like Eat, like quickness of use is like one of the deciding factors of whether an app is good or not. But at the time, that was just kind of a hunch. Um, and I think it was also uh, like motivated by things like like Snapchat, right? Like the and Instagram. Like the reason those things, and I guess Uber as well. The reason those products are like so massively successful is pretty much because they're really quick. Like you can use them really quickly. Um, and so I think those were those were pretty big inspirations for us too. And I think even going back to the industry you're disrupting, by the time I log into some of these sites and even get to the page I want, I already feel like I have to move on to the next thing. And I haven't even done what I needed to do. Yeah. It's kind of interesting. I my my mom is actually into stocks. Um, so she talks to me about it a lot. And I kind of seeing the way that she uses her online brokerages before Robinhood was 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 like a pretty big motivation for me <clears throat> because like when she when she like is going to buy or sell stock, what she basically does is like she like goes home. She has to go home first of all, <laughs> and then she has to like she has to like strap into this like workstation and like sit at this like battle station and then and then use her her product to like buy a stock and it's like well what if you just wanted to like do it while you're out like buying some groceries or like doing whatever it is that you're doing during the day it's just like it seems silly that like a lot of the online brokerages have kind of told you that you have to be the sort of consumer that wants to you know, like strap into your desktop and like be in front of eight screens before you use this. That's product. how it feels, though. Yeah. What about everyone else? Like, I personally am like not a particularly um, like savvy day trader or anything. Like, I kind of use Robinhood very casually, and that's the reason I use it. Like, I've had other stock brokerage accounts before, and I use them like maybe once a month. I would just go and be like, "Oh, okay. Like, my three stocks are doing well, or they're not." And like now, it's like I get much more day-to-day -day feedback, and um, I kind of know when the highs are high and the lows are low, and I, yeah, I just feel much more connected with it. It but feels like much less of a mystery now. You're getting me so excited because listening to you talk about this just demonstrates how immersed you guys are in this problem and how great of a job you're doing to solve it. So moving on to the team that you're bringing on to help you do this. How do you instill that in them? Because I know you guys, you and your co-founder Vlad, have been adamant about bringing on the best people possible. Yeah, um, you can actually see a decent number of people behind us. This is like one of our engineering, uh, one of our engineering areas. Um, I think it, it's kind of like self-selection, right? When we talk to new candidates, I make it a point to like sit down very early on with um, anyone that we're going to bring on board and I kind of tell them I spend the entire time actually just talking about why we're doing what we're doing um, and the motivation behind like wanting to build a financial company that doesn't always doesn't put its profits before its customers um, 
And a lot of the candidates that we're talking to, like they've got a lot of other options. And so if, if like sitting through a conversation about like why we're doing what we're doing makes sense to them at the end, like, and they want to keep talking, I think that's like usually a pretty good signal. So you actually base it on that initial conversation and how much they contribute. You're not asking them like specific questions. Oh yeah. I mean, we, we do that in follow up interviews and stuff like that, but like, it's very like with a company like ours, which I hate to say this cause it sounds a little bit cliche, but it is very much a mission driven company. Mm -hmm. Like, I think that's really important. Like if you, if a person that joins doesn't like sort of buy into this idea of, of why we're doing what we're doing, like it's probably not going to be a great place for them to work even like after a month or two, right? I love it. How do you know when you're, whether it's in that initial conversation or it's in a follow-up interview, how do you know that the person you're talking to is going to come on and be a leader on your team? Um, that's an interesting question. I think well, we hire a lot of we hire a lot of people out of college, which is really interesting. Um, we obviously have some more experienced people, but we're we're like um, like basically walking distance from Stanford. Not a bad college to pick kids from. Yeah, not a bad college, <laughs> and um, you know I think it's just really clear. Like some people, I mean, we have a lot of people that have joined Robinhood that that are very entrepreneurial people that have basically said that it's either starting their own company or joining Robinhood. Um, and I think this is a big enough opportunity that it really gives a, a lot of people that are very entrepreneurial the chance to like take ownership over a lot of stuff um, within an opportunity that, that we think is like going to be pretty big. So like some of the folks on the team like Y Combinator before joining Robinhood. And so there's, there's a healthy number of people that like are very much entrepreneurial. But at this point, we have like a nice blend of people. There are a lot of specialists that have joined as well that, that aren't necessarily like, oh, I want to be in charge of this, that, or the other thing, but that are like, these are really difficult technical problems that I want to like make sure we solve correctly. Um, so it's a nice balance of people so far. And I mean, there's, there's definitely a big challenge. Like we're growing from like sort of the 20 person range to like 30, 40 people. Uh, this year, maybe even bigger, and it's like every step is um, just like a totally new. It's just like a totally new experience, right? So I think it's it's very challenging for me, at least, to like you know to to be in a position where I'm like sort of definitely learning how dynamics of companies work as as we get bigger. What I love about what you said is I can immediately tell that. Everyone who's behind you in the office, everyone who's working with you guys has a stake in the product because they really believe in what you're doing. You said you're going from 20 to 30 to 40. As you get to that 40 and higher, how are you going to make sure that everyone still feels that and feels totally comfortable coming up to you and saying, hey, I've got a great idea. Do you have a second? Um, yeah, one, a couple of things that we're doing um, – Vlad and I both are doing is we're we're sort of trying to get into the habit of having one on ones with with lots of people that we're working with on our team, so that there is like a direct conversation between us and everyone that joins. Um, we have a lot of like sort of all hand meetings once or twice a week, where we are very easy to like reach and talk to. I mean, we sit like right in in the middle of everyone, so it's very easy to kind of get in touch with us. Um, and I think it's also the way that, um, we think about compensation definitely is a part of it as well. Like we want to make sure that everybody that that's joining and that is, you know, a meaningful contributor to the team also gets equity stake in the company. And so that the success of the company doesn't really leave anyone behind. So that's also very important. You mentioned Vlad and you working together and you guys actually met when you were roommates at Stanford Yeah, and you've done, this is your third venture together. How has yeah. that relationship evolved? Oh, it's great. Um, <laughs> like Vlad and I have known each other for like the better part of 10 years now, which is awesome because we've got such a long working history, but I, I fear also dates us a little bit. Um, <laughs> but we met when we were, uh, when we were undergrads at Stanford. Um, it was, I think it was, um, 
the summer after my sophomore year at school and summer after his freshman year. And we were both in this like uh, summer research program together through the physics department at Stanford. And, um, you know, we just kind of like, we, we kind of spotted each other in the department. Mm -hmm. It's like, we were the only two uh, people with like this sort of like 1972 Mick Jagger haircut <laughs> going on. Um, and we were both like very dorky looking still, but we had like kind of shaggy hair. And when we when we actually like met and became friends, we realized we had a lot of things in common. Like we were both only children. Our parents were both immigrants to the U.S. Uh, we both grew up in Virginia, which is kind of crazy. Also uh, born there. Oh, nice. Um, and yeah, I, I guess we just like became very comfortable through taking a lot of classes together in college. At um, we got we became very comfortable learning from one another. And I think that's like a very important part of building companies is just like realizing that you are not going to know what to do um, at every stage of the company you get to. It's just like a totally new set of problems. And the fact that we spent all this time very early on in our relationship, like working on problem sets together, or working on labs together, um, we kind of know how to ask each other questions. We also know what each one of us is like differentially better at. And like what sorts of things we're kind of not very good at, um, yeah. And at this point, you know, we're we're like brothers, so it's it's a really good relationship. So is that division of labor just seamless now? It's totally seamless. Yeah, um, we find that we like oftentimes we'll go like three or four days without even directly talking to each other. But as soon as we pick up, we'll just like end up talking about the exact same things. So we independently kind of like we're thinking the same things were important. You're on this, that same creepy wavelength. Yeah, like very creepy wavelength. <laughs> yeah. So I want to move forward to a question we have from our audience. Hannah wants to know what we can expect from Robinhood in 2015. Yeah. I think in 2015, you will you can see a lot of um, new platforms that we're going to add. So Android is an obvious one. Um, we will also be doing stuff on the web, and um, I think pretty much any device that you want to use Robinhood on, it'll it'll be there, and it'll be a really nice experience. Um, later on this year, we're also going to roll out some of the more advanced features for people that are slightly more active traders. So you should expect things like margin trading, um, recurring deposits, uh, uh, ACATs, wire transfers, stuff like that, and. Hopefully we'll get options trading this year as well. Pardon me. And probably the last thing this year that's going to happen is we're going to roll out our API to a select number of partners. So that should be pretty cool too. So that takes me directly all of those features you're talking about into a question that everyone's asking about you guys. And I love how Vlad and you are responding. So everyone wants to know how are you going to make money from this? How is this going to be profitable? And you guys are very comfortable waiting for your demographic to be ready to take those next steps. Can you address that profitability piece? Yeah, certainly. Um, I think one of the things that a lot of people don't understand <coughs> about brokerages is that the commissions that you see a lot of um, other broker dealers charging, those commissions are entirely discretionary. Like it doesn't actually cost you know, E-Trade or Fidelity, $10 to make a trade. Um, and so, and if you take if you take that into consideration and you also look at how um, major online brokerages make money, it turns out that it's about between 15 and 30% of the revenues that they make in total come from, from commissions. So the majority of the revenues are coming from other things like um, cash balances and customer accounts, margin trading, um, you know, uh, lending out securities for short sale, um, and a variety of other things. And our basic view on it was that electronic brokerages, online brokerages in general are generally very healthy businesses. They generate a lot of revenue. And we just wanted to eliminate the primary costs that the sort of smaller accounts that people with this the, the least amount of money to invest, we wanted to eliminate the costs that those customers pay. And so we basically think that if we 
um, eliminate those costs that come in the form of commissions and we continue to monetize in the other ways that online brokerages do, then we'll be able to easily make up for that 15% of revenue or whatever we're giving away by being 15% bigger, having 15% more customers or, you know, having considerably more than that, basically. So that answer ties directly into the question that I'm ending every 33 Founders interviews with this series. Like I shared with you before, I just graduated from school and I recently have started understanding the uncertainty that comes working at a startup. And I don't love it. So I thought that I'd ask everyone how they're overcoming it. The way you just answered that question, Beiju, makes me see how you're looking ahead. And just because there's been some companies who have tried to do what you're doing and have failed, that's not pushing you back at all. You guys have a mission and you're planning on accomplishment, accomplishing it. On the days that you feel uncertain, what are you telling yourself? I love uncertainty. Oh, God, um, you're one of those. Don't love I, uncertainty. I'll tell you why, actually. I wasn't like this when I first started doing this. Um, this is like one of this has been like one of like the most valuable lessons that um, Vlad has ever taught me, and Vlad is one of those people that just truly loves uncertainty. And I think when we first started working on startups together, um, I was always the one that was a little bit more cautious, or when things got kind of uncertain, like I would get like stressed out or, or nervous and stuff. And Vlad always just kind of you know it was just like water off a duck's back. It just never bothered him. And I just saw how much he enjoyed that and kind of thrived in, in those environments. And I was like, that's like, well, that's, that seems like a, such a better way of dealing with uncertainty is rather than looking at it as this thing that is out of your control um, or like kind of makes you anxious or whatever, just learn to live with it and embrace it. And I found that when I stop sort of fixating on things that are uncertain or like letting that bother me. Um, it just makes me a lot more creative. It's sort of like learning to let go um, and see, and having seen in the past that when I have done that, it's let me be a lot more creative in the future. Now that whenever I see uncertainty, I'm like, okay, like this is a good chance for me to be creative. So that's probably a very wishy-washy answer. No, I've, that, just, I've just, I've never, answers. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. You, you might just be my Vlad. Now I might start loving uncertainty. Yeah. That's perfect. A, and I only had to ask like four questions the whole season. Yeah, there you go. Well, thank you so much for being with us today. Can you let everyone know how they can stay up to date with you and everything you guys are doing? Yeah, certainly. Um, probably the most direct way is to uh, like follow us on Twitter or on Facebook. We're pretty active posting updates. And um, other than that, look for us to make some announcements probably close to the end of this month. Um, Perfect. Thank so, you so yeah. much for being with us. Yeah. Thanks so much for your time.